Good morning from London. Welcome to Race to Zero, Mobilizing Leadership for a Net Zero Economy, brought to you by the UN Global Compact Compact Network UK. My name is Marcia Valiciano and I am a global head of corporate responsibility for Relex. We are the world's knowledge company with 33,000 colleagues around the world and we are focused on our unique contributions as a business which include universal sustainable access to information, promoting science and health, protection of society, fostering the rule of law and access to justice. And we are very proud to be one of 36 lead companies. And we're committed to doing our part on the sustainable development goals, including through the free Relex SDG Resource Center, which is content, tools, and events, and also the SDG News Tracker, which is uh, drawing on more than 75,000 news sources for up to the minute news on the SDGs. It is also my honor to be the chair of the UN Global Compact UK Network. And our mission is to turn momentum on sustainability into practical local action. And we work on three pillars. We want to inspire business ambition to deliver the global goals. We want to enable practical action. We want to shape a responsible business environment. And we offer a wide range of engagement opportunities through three primary work streams. Uh, we're working with partners and participants um, and others on these three areas, the global goals, business and human rights and climate action. Now, of course, that's our theme this morning is climate action. And among the ways that we support our members on climate, we are helping them with their compliance on TCFD. We are um, helping them to set science-based targets to reduce their emissions. And we also are a partner in advancing business ambition for the one and a half degrees campaign. And we're also preparing for COP26. It was postponed due to the pandemic, but it will be happening between the 1st and the 12th, 2021 in Glasgow. So that brings us to the session today. Uh, earlier this month, the high level climate champions along with the UK Business uh, Secretary, Alok Sharma, um, and others launched Race to Zero. It's a campaign to drive business commitments on net zero emissions targets on the lead up to COP26. So this is a very important agenda. It's a beacon for the um, nations of the world, and in particular, their climate negotiators to raise their ambitions on the climate. It is my pleasure now to hand you over to Dr. Thomas Hale. He's Associate Professor of Global Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of uh, Government at the University of Oxford. Thomas has been actively involved in creating the Race to Zero campaign, including coordinating dialogues to develop the criteria required for participation um, in the campaign. So I know it's going to be a great session. Thomas, over to you, and I'll be back a little bit later. Thank you, Marcia, and thank you everyone for joining us this morning. We're delighted that you're here because we're here to discuss what I think is a very important campaign at a very critical time. One of the expressions that I've heard a lot over the past few weeks is that there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And I think we're seeing this power of an idea whose time has come play out across the country, across the world, um, in a whole range of different contexts, most saliently recently in the context of racial justice. Um, but if we look across the climate change space, we're seeing this extraordinary transition around the power of net zero, of the race to zero campaign as this uh, leading idea, which is taking off and getting more traction than we ever really expected it would. Um, if you remember back five years ago, for those of you who are working in the climate change space, You'll of course remember that around the Paris Agreement, there was this huge push by 
the small island states, by vulnerable countries, by climate leaders to get 1.5 degrees into the Paris Agreement. And indeed, they succeeded. And that was a big, big surprise for us at the time, right? It seemed like a fringe idea, this idea of climate um, focusing on 1.5 degrees. But then, years later, three years later, rather, we saw a new report from the IPCC saying that actually 1.5 degrees was necessary to preserve climate safety. Um, and here's the pathways that would be required to get there. And so this small idea, which emerged from the fringes of the climate discourse around 2015, has then taken this big step forward with the IPCC, and now is something that we see being taken up by a whole range of different countries, cities, states and regions, investors, and of course, as we're gonna talk about today, businesses. Um, and actually at the Race to Zero launch, there was an interesting report that showed that over half of global GDP, measured in terms of the actors um, uh, who make up global GDP, have now committed to, or thinking about committing to a net zero target. And to imagine we came from this sort of fringe idea in 2015 to this big global tipping point in the, in the economy just five years later is to my mind really proof of an idea whose time has come. And the question we want to address today is how we take that forward. What do we do with that idea now at this real critical juncture for not just a climate crisis, but for economic crisis? We've all seen the, the unemployment numbers from the UK this morning, a lot of sobering information there, a health crisis, a justice crisis, et cetera. And to do that, we have a fantastic group of climate leaders joining us today. I'm gonna to ask them to come in now and, and in, uh, introduce them um, to you. So first, in just alphabetical order, we have uh, Fiona Ball. Fiona is the director of The Bigger Picture at Sky, um, and she is a, spear, uh, a spearhead of their responsible business, social impact, and, and uh, other kind of social uh, impact strategies. Um, and she has worked with uh, a number of other groups here on the panel. So welcome, Fiona. Um, we're also joined by Rebecca Marmot, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Unilever. Unilever, of course, has a big new announcement that came out yesterday, which we're all excited to hear more about. Uh, so welcome, Rebecca. We're also joined by Paul Crimson, who is the CEO and co-founder of CDP, the leading nonprofit organization that tracks and reports on companies' climate uh, progress and what kind of targets they're making, how much progress they're making vis-a-vis -vis those targets. Welcome, Paul. Um, and last but certainly not least, Tanya Steele, who is the uh, Chief Executive of WWF UK. Um, and she has really, uh, amongst her many um, uh, priorities, that emphasize especially the role of nature and the global food system um, as a key part of the Net Zero Challenge. So welcome to you all. Great to have you here with us today. I think the question on everyone's minds is why? Why now, at this strange, strange moment, we're all speaking to each other over platforms such as this one, why focus on net zero, of all things? So it sounds like a long-term abstract concept at a time when people are worried about health, are worried about their jobs, are worried about longstanding injustices and inequalities. What's the relevance of this now? Um, I wonder if we might start with you, Fiona, to tell us why now, from your perspective. I think it's it's, it's about the timing. It's it, you know we we are in a really important decade. Um, if we are going to stay below one and a half degrees warming or have any likelihood of doing that, then the the reality is that um, all businesses need to make a commitment and and um, countries and governments too to reduce our carbon emissions by half. So this is a big challenge. And if we don't start now, that challenge is going to get more and more difficult. Um, and I think we have a real opportunity coming back from the global pandemic to rebuild properly so that we have the proper policy, we have the proper framework in place so businesses can make the right decisions and start doing that, um, uh, start doing that early. Because we have to, and also if uh, there's no better time than the present to get started, probably actually the better time but given that we can't do that what an opportunity um yeah. becca i wonder if, if you I hope you can hear us we can't um why now for this big announcement that unilever made yesterday oh rebecca we can't hear you um hopefully we'll get that sorted out um but i know we're all waiting with bated breath to to see what what you have to say on that front um, let me jump to you, Paul, if I may. I mean, you look across a whole range of different businesses every year. Um, why now? What are, what are you thinking from, from your own organization's perspective, but also from the larger community of businesses that you're engaging with? 
Yeah, thanks, Thomas. I very much agree with Fiona. I mean, obviously, we must follow the science. That's been the, the mantra in the climate community for, for a while. I mean, even more than a decade. Um, but it's really got stronger. So on climate, we have to follow the science. We know on the pandemic, we have to follow the science. We've learned about the R rate. So do we know what's right? No, let's follow the science. That's just uh, the IPCC report on 1.5 says the only safe level of warming is, is 1.5. We could even debate that. And what, very much what Fiona said, this is the critical decade. We're actually late. You referred to this, Thomas. We're already late. But we have no time to lose. We must cut emissions in half in the next decade to net zero by 2050. So we need a short term and long term goal. But it's the only goal we can have if we want to secure a safe and resilient economy. And we've all learned how vulnerable ultimately human systems are. So let's make them as strong as they can be. We have no choice but to learn how to build us, make ourselves more resilient. Um, Rebecca, I hope you can hear me now. Um, I, I can, yeah. can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Welcome. Thank you. So, so why now? We, we saw that there was a big announcement from your company yesterday. Why do this at this particular moment? Well, we already had science-based targets in place yesterday. Um, but we realized we needed to go further, which is why we announced net zero on all our products by, by 2039 as part of an integrated set of commitments. Um, they recognize the inextricable link between tackling climate crisis and protecting and regenerating nature. I think, you know, as to why right now, I think with the COVID pandemic, rightly so being front and center, I think we haven't forgotten, we, the world, the two glaring big global crises of, of climate and social inequality, they've not gone away. And I think it's accentuated that need for collective action. And certainly I, all of us have been turning to the scientists to, to educate us and help tackle the COVID crisis. And I think that belief in science really underpins our actions around protecting the planet and livelihood and, and the economy. We didn't heed the risks of, of a global pandemic for many years. We didn't prepare adequately. We need to learn from this experience now and collectively address this climate crisis with business and, and government leadership. Um, encourage more countries and, 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 and companies to really get themselves behind the goals that were set out in, in the Paris Agreement. I'm hearing a very consistent message of, of the science giving us few other choices but to pursue this and actually the epidemic and the pandemic rather uh, emphasizing the, the need to listen to this kind of preventative risk mitigation scientific view um, and to make as much progress as we can on that front. Tanya, you look at this question from an advocacy perspective um, do you, and that's obviously I think a message you'll be pleased to be hearing business representatives speak to. Um, what, why now, though? What, from your view, what can uh, we uh, learn from where we're, at, where we're at the world today to think about this idea whose time has come? Well, I suspect in some ways I'll be agreeing with other panelists, and, and rightly so. I mean, first of all, the ambition of the race to zero is the right one. But equally, as Paul's highlighted, um, these commitments and these, these, these clarion calls have come before. So what is different right now? And for me, I guess it's it's probably two or threefold, um, as all the panelists have echoed, that the science is telling us that we, we really don't have any time to lose. And quite literally, from a tipping point perspective, if we lose the Amazon, we have fundamentally lost the fight against climate change. And if we don't start to see some stabilization across the two poles, uh, in terms of melting levels, particularly the Greenland ice sheet, um, the consequences start to become quite catastrophic. So I guess for me, I'd probably highlight a couple of things. Yes, the science-based target. There are means and a method by which we can almost uh, put some logic behind what are some potentially quite critical consequences. But it also gives businesses and uh, the finances, the people, the intellect that sits behind it to actually start to make that move and make that transition. So for me, it's actually critical that this moves from pure advocacy. Advocacy and ideas are great. We need policy shifts to enable business to do this. But also, this is a real opportunity for business to apply those targets and those steps themselves. So I think there's a pretty clear, consistent message emerging here. Um, and just one small housekeeping message for us. We great people can mute themselves when you're not speaking just to minimize the feedback loop, um, which you can do with a little button just under the video. Um, but uh, so this message of science directing us to take this action in a way we, we, we kind of knew that before um, in some ways. And indeed, 
uh, from 2015, the small islands of vulnerable states were pushing us to, to recognize this. Um, so I'm wondering if there's any change in your thinking in the last few months that this particular juncture has added a new dimension to. Is there anything, what, how are we thinking about net zero now in a different way? Tanya, I think you alluded to this just now of, of recognizing the interlinkages and the kind of um, ir irretrievable losses that we might face. But is there anything new in our thinking? Um, I wonder if, you know, if I might come back to you. Is there anything you're thinking differently now uh, about this longstanding goal um, under our new situation? I think for me, less us thinking differently, but I think we really acknowledge and we welcome um, how much of the thinking has shifted around us. We've, uh, as an organization, WWF is, is science led, and we've, we've always laid this out as a triple challenge in terms of how will we uh, feed a population of eight, maybe even 10 billion people in the future without warming our world any further and without destroying what we have less of our natural resources. Mm. And that is about the interconnection, if you like. So biodiversity loss, so land use change, et cetera, and climate are two sides of the same coin. And of course, what we've seen at the heart of the pandemic has ultimately related to our food system. And indeed, if it hadn't have emerged uh, potentially from a uh, market in China, it could have easily emerged from elsewhere in the world. So I guess right. that's one element for me in terms of the interlock. I think the other thing, it's the urgency. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary what the world has done and has put in place in the last 90 days in responding to this crisis. And I'd probably quote Mark Carney in this regard. He talks consistently about the need for risk and resilience. Uh, but I think for me, one of the most compelling statements is we cannot self-isolate from climate change. No, indeed. <laughs> uh, so, so what steps do we need to take? Exactly. So uh, interconnections, I think, are certainly highlighted here. And has your thinking changed at all on this net zero idea? What have we learned recently that makes us might, might make us think about it a little bit differently? Yeah, so I think um, when, when we have a look at the kind of ambition and what Sky needs to do to be net zero carbon, when we have a look across the whole of our value chain, a significant proportion of that is how we engage both with our suppliers and also our customers. Our, our customers effectively make up 67% of our carbon footprint. That's over a million tonnes. Of, of carbon. And I think what, what we have found in the last few months is actually we've got to a tipping point of people wanting to take action. In a lot of results that we've been doing um, um, and, and, and research, 80% of the UK population and the European population would do exactly the same what they've done through the last two or three months to help the climate. So I think you know, every, I think there's, there's been a big shift in, in people wanting to understand what their role is. And, and that's what we wanting to do. And that's where our focus in is, is, is in um, as part of um, our voice to, to help inspire people. I mean, we're working really closely with WWF on this around um, how we and we're, we're, we're looking to um, start this now in August, September time. We were wanting to get you know, a really good grip on when is the right time to start engaging um, the public around this area and really get people to be kind of ocean and climate heroes, because obviously they are both intrinsically linked um, around the opportunities to reduce carbon emissions, but also the opportunities to restore um, our natural carbon sinks are really important. Um, we've got a big programme to really help and engage kind of our consumers and the public around what steps that they can do. So I think mm -hmm. there is, yeah, we've, we've over the next last two or three months, there has been a real shift and there's a, a real opportunity to use this time to um, you know, help and support people understand what small steps that they can do. Yeah, I think there's certainly been a widespread recognition across the whole world, certainly here in the UK, that um, in this time of crisis, we saw a huge growth in people's interest in supporting the local communities and thinking how they can come together. One of the silver linings of a very tragic situation has been a real emphasis on what, what can I do, what can people do? Um, so I'm wondering, uh, Rebecca, if you might see refer to that a bit in your, um, if you could explain to us a bit more about your your big announcement yesterday for Unilever. I mean, it was a big step forward in terms of your already ambitious targets. Um, but how does it fit into the situation? And is it different than it would have been if we weren't in a pandemic? Sorry, I missed the last part of your question. How is it different to? 
I'm curious if the big change uh, that you announced yesterday was in some ways influenced or was it made, uh, the, was the rationale for making this step in some way influenced by the pandemic? Was there a well, I think I talk, I think I talked a, a little bit at the beginning about the correlations between what I think we've done as a world in terms of stepping up and taking collective action to try and fight against COVID-19. Um, and the fact from it, certainly from a Unilever perspective, we realize now that we can't go back to the old system that was in place beforehand. It's very much now around what we need to do in terms of reinvention. And you know, at a, at a global level, I think we've seen quite a lot of evidence of stimulus packages coming out that put a green recovery very much at the front and center. We've seen that, for example, with the EU Green Deal. And I think when I look at Unilever and the impact that that's having on us as a company, you know, there are very different ways that I think we as, as a global business will operate. And when I think about what we launched yesterday, you know, reaching that zero will mean us operating our business in, in really quite a radically different way. Um, I think accentuating what we had already done in the past, but, but, but hugely accelerating that. So probably, I guess, three areas and, and, and drawing on things some of the other panel have already said. And we'd, we'd already done quite a lot of work in the first area around decarbonisation, looking at how do we shift to renewable energy in our own operations. We achieved that at the beginning of this year. And of course, upstream in the value chain and looking at how can we use um, the work that we have with suppliers, our supplier partnerships and our procurement to prioritise now suppliers who set their own science-based targets. I think the second big point, and Fiona, you talked about this, is looking at consumers and the role that we can play in terms of innovation so you know the onus is on us to explore whether we can make our products differently how can we lower their footprint how can we come up with new ways to meet consumer needs that are extrinsically around zero carbon and then i think linked to that and, and part of yesterday's announcement was a 1 billion euro climate and nature fund which we launched to really try and put the consumer communication at the front and center of what we're talking about. So when I think about some of the work our brands have done over the past few years, so brands like Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream who did a big campaign around if it's melted, it's ruined or seventh generation in the United States. We've done a lot of consumer facing work through their brand campaigns about the importance of energy. What we're trying to do now is to join up the, the advocacy work that we're doing with governments and really pushing for you know, net zero targets to be put in place from governments around the world. That's around short term uh, reducing emissions, but then longer term, how do we build back post COVID um, through a green recovery plan that I talked about at the beginning to make sure that in the long term, we are achieving those, those 2050 targets that we've set up. So how do we join up that government level advocacy with the partnerships on the ground and then bring that to life through these big consumer facing campaigns so I think really integrating a, a multi-stakeholder model, so not viewing this purely as, as something that is around advocacy, not just viewing it as something that's in our own operations, or not just viewing it as something that's around consumer um, connections and, and enabling consumers to make those changes, but really ensuring that you join up those different facets. And I think to your point around COVID, we've seen that only really collective action has been successful and, and joining up the actions of those different stakeholders. I think it's, Rebecca, to, to uh, think about how putting this issue at the center of not just your own operations, but also your engagement with suppliers and consumers and governments is a part of an integrated package. Paul, I wonder if you could say a bit about how you see this question of the role of business particularly, because we're seeing net zero targets from all kinds of different actors. Um, we're seeing a lot of demand from, from people, um, consumers, citizens, et cetera. Um, Governments, of course, have a special responsibility to set policy and, and to lead, but what do you think is, is the kind of key contribution the business community can make um, in this way? Uh, thanks, Thomas. I very much agree with, with other panelists on, on what this means for now. Uh, you know, from our perspective at CDP, and we're part of the Women Business Coalition, uh, we think, you know, business it needs to do at least three things. I mean, there are many things business should need to do, and it's great to have Unilever and Sky, who I think are doing most, if not all of them. Um, but first of all, commit to ambition. You know, we're talking about net zero by 2050. 30 years is a long way out for a business. 
but we need to think like that in terms of climate. So signing up to the business ambition for 1.5 statement led by you and Global Compact to say we are going to commit to 1.5. We don't even if we don't know how to get there. This is the ambition. We follow the science. We accept it. We're going to get there. You know that commitment is really important. Setting the science-based target. Say here's our five-year targets that we're committed and we'll get on the pathway. We'll be transparent about that and disclose, and we'll be accountable for that. And if we can do well, we can share the learning. If we struggle, we can also talk about that. Maybe we need more government action. So that ambition, um, you know, following ambition comes action, like the you know Sky and Unilever are already taking, but. Um, committing to 100% renewable energy, or at least substantially increasing renewable energy, uh, moving to electric vehicles, engaging suppliers, customers, employees. Uh, there's so much businesses across the value chain have so many interconnections, and they need to, you know, leverage all of those interconnections for change uh, and demonstrate real action. And we, we're lucky we're getting to a point where technology now in renewables, in electric vehicles, of energy efficiency has been there for a while. It's very cost effective if you take the right time horizon, five or, or longer years. And finally, businesses need to advocate. Uh, the dialogue between policymakers and businesses in some places, you know, richer, Europe um, is pretty good. But businesses need to say, this is what we can do and this is what we need from policymakers. And to have that dialogue, to really create an ambition loop, we as businesses will go further but we need additional policies, incentives, measures to help us go even further so that businesses and governments and other actors really collaborate and work together. And ultimately, this is a huge transition in the economy and society that's required. We're only going to get there by working together. So I think it's the ambition, the action and the advocacy that we expect to see from business and really seek to support business to do. And we, we see you know, momentum there growing enormously. Great. So ambition, action, and advocacy, three excellent things. Now, to, to, let's play devil's advocate a bit. So, you know, let's, let's be serious here. We're looking potentially at the worst economic crisis in our lifetimes, possibly in a century or more than a century. Like, this is a, a pretty unique position that we're in. Um, businesses are, need to make uh, revenue. They need to pay their employees, they need to pay their shareholders. Um, they're all going through, many of them, an existential crisis. Now, will I even exist next year or in two years from now? So, you know, given the real crisis moment we're in, um, how, how can we, like, spare the mental space to think about this longer-term resilient question? It's such a, it seems like such a, a dissonance. I wonder if I might speak the, to Fiona and Rebecca, you might say a bit about, like, really the, this crisis moment that we're in, where companies are really thinking, am I going to survive? Why is, like, now the time to be talking about this climate stuff. Um, does it really make sense? Fiona, do you want to uh, offer your thoughts from, from Sky's perspective? Yeah, sure. So I think, um, I mean, environment's always been um, a really important um, thing on a number of different ways for business and why it's really important for us to still keep really focused on it. One is around talent and keeping and retaining employees during this time. You know, if, if you know businesses are going to um, recover and bounce back, they need to keep their talent, they need to keep their employees um, alongside them and have the right talent. And I think there's, you know, it's, it's really clear that, um, you know, um, young talent um, are wanting to work for businesses that have climate change at the center um, and, and not just climate change, a number of the, you know, the global sustainability goals at the centre of their of their values and and um, their DNA. Um, so and and now actually we're in a position that we, we've kind of all proved that we can all work from home pretty damn effectively, to be perfectly honest, which is having a really positive environmental impact in some areas of our business in terms of our direct business and scope one and two and commuting. But it actually brings a, another kind of interesting piece around. The, the scope of the talent that you can attract to your business has probably winded quite significantly. So, so employees and talent will have a wider pool of, of businesses to, um, to go to. So I think by you know, keeping it front and centre as part of your, your business is going to keep long term the right talent and the right employees who have the same value settings as yourself going forward. I also think that it's just coming back in 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 a in a good way in 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 a way that's um, you know just good business. I mean, if you focus on the environmental issues, if you look at particularly scope one and two, they do have 
you know, significant cost savings involved when you're having a look at how you can reduce your emissions, whether that's through building efficiency kind of and, and the lighting, whether that's through commuting, whether that's through how you can kind of reduce and, and kind of shift. And you know, there might be, you know, the majority of things that we invest in do have a very significant and quick payback, and that's going to help the, the business recover. Um, you know, the, the other thing is that our customers are really calling out for businesses, um, you know, to to be, um, you know, to be champions in, in climate. And if we want to retain our customers and, you know, for the long term, then we, we need to address the issues that matter to them as well. This shift, both for employees, potential employees, for consumers, are really not giving businesses a They're saying you must perform well on this because our expectations are raised in these ways. Um, Rebecca, is that the case you also make internally to maybe some of your colleagues who say, this is kind of crazy, why are we doing all of this at this moment? Or how do you approach the question in the business? Oh, sorry, I think you're on mute, Rebecca. Uh, no, not hearing you yet. Oh, thank you. Um, there we go, there we go. I would echo what what Fiona was was saying. I think the reality is that we're you know we're facing more than one crisis right now. We, we've talked a, a bit already about the pandemic, but we, we can't we can't drop the ball on the climate crisis. And actually, without a healthy planet and healthy people, you can't have a healthy business. So you know I see this both short term of of dealing with some of the immediate issues that we've got around COVID, but longer term the commitments that we announced yesterday are about protecting and looking after the health of our planet and, and nature for future generations. And that's also about future proofing our business. So at Unilever over the past few years, we've developed a, a similar actually to what Fiona was talking about, a four pronged matrix when we're looking at the business case around acting, whether it's on climate or whether it's around social inequity, growth, trust, risk and cost are the four different dynamics that we look at. Um, from a growth perspective, we know that where we put sustainability, and in this case, we're talking about climate, and, and yesterday for us, it was around climate and nature. We know when we put that front and center of the work that we're doing in the consumer facing world, so through brands, and I talked about the examples with Ben and Jerry's or seventh generation that have made climate change very much the pivot of their consumer facing proposition and what they stand for. Those brands are our fastest growing brands, and they're the kind of brands that are centered with core sustainability credentials, absolutely at the heart of what they stand for. So it's growth in a very much in a sustainable way. So that's the first part. The second part is around trust. Um, talent is an absolutely, I agree with Fiona, talent is absolutely a key part of that. But also I think trust in the wider community. You know, people want to know now about the business behind the brands and the products that they're buying or they're signing up to or the services that are part of their lives. And I think that increased transparency is absolutely essential. So being very clear as a business, what you stand for, have you signed up to science-based targets? What are you doing around nature? What are you doing around social inequity? It's hugely, hugely important. So those are the first two. And then I think for the, you know, for the doomsayers who, who don't believe in that, which some people don't, I don't know why, because for me, they are inextricably linked. But actually, it's also about reducing risk and it's about reducing cost. So when I think of some of the work that we've done with Tanya and WWF over the years, you know, we've done a lot around trying to future-proof our supply chains. And of course, when you think about the impact of climate change on where we're sourcing crops and commodities around the world, what does that mean in terms of changing growing patterns? What does it mean in terms of working with farmers who are the custodians of the land for, for now and for future generations? How can we work much more effectively with, effectively with them one of the things we talked about yesterday was the launch of a new regenerative agriculture code that takes some of these issues which are impacting smallholder farmers on a day-to-day -day basis, looking at what's stopping them from being able to, to thrive and to grow. And you know, many of those things might be linked into better training around agriculture techniques, around things like water harvesting, it could be around things like drip irrigation. And when you put a climate lens on top of all of the supply chain, you know, clearly there are huge benefits for a business like Unilever in ensuring that we are protecting and working on water basins, on agriculture techniques that are climate friendly. And then lastly, you know, around cost. We, I talked earlier around, um, uh, we were 
delighted to this year be able to say that we now have renewable energy across all of our operations, which of course is the best thing to do for the environment. But again, you know, for people that ever doubted that that made business sense, that saved us your millions and millions of euros over the short term and increasingly moving forward. So I think that growth trust risk cost lens when you're looking at any of these sorts of decisions is hugely important because it combines what we all instinctively know is the right thing to do very much in a sound commercial um, business model. Uh, so I think a really important point that this is coming from the actual day-to-day -day work of the business to think through the things that matter. So thank you, Rebecca and Fiona, for giving us a little deep dive into how from a kind of inside perspective it looks like. I wonder though if we might um, turn to Tanya and then Paul to say a bit more about how the external set of collaborations might be relevant here. So um, we've launched this Race to Zero campaign. Many of your, I think all of your organizations are part of it. Um, you are trying to promote um, more and more net zero targets across the world, especially here relevant to here in the business community. What's the role of this kind of collaboration? Is this is kind of get together and feel good or, or can this actually help us get to where we need to go? What's the value of these sort of collaborations? Um, and audience, please continue to put the great questions and comments into the chat bar. We'll come to those uh, momentarily. But first, it's a word from Tanya and Paul on this question of collaboration. I think um, just quickly from a collaboration point of view, it's essential. I would argue that uh, we should increasingly treat it as pre-competitive. Um, there's no doubt that businesses rightly should prosper but this is so significant. Uh, if ever there was an opportunity for businesses to share and to learn with each other, it's right now. If I use a tech example, if we think about the importance and growth of the application programming interface all those decades ago, and how it creates an explosion of tech, of application developers, and all the things we love right now, that was quite a shift in that industry, but it effectively enabled many more to prosper and obviously benefit from that. I guess the question is, where are the collaboration opportunities for businesses and organizations right now? And certainly when um, I hear from Sky and Unilever and the incredible strides they're making, I'm very optimistic about what business can do, but also importantly to draw some of the, whether it's naysayers, I think one of the panelists said, or the laggards behind. This is possible, this is genuinely good business because it's sustainable and it's circular. So uh, the more we can inspire and share, uh, I think the better ultimately the results will be. Paul, well, collaboration, what role is it play? I mean, I think uh, Tanya makes a great point that, you know, we face a crisis if we don't act, so everybody should collaborate to create a sustainable economy and that, you know, everybody has to act. It's companies, their investors, their suppliers, the governments, the cities, companies operate in, the states and regions. You know, very much the design of the Paris Agreement was not just governments, it's all these actors, us as citizens. So, we have to collaborate. We have to be honest. None of us have all the answers. Uh, if we did, someone would have solved this by now. Uh, people are stronger together. Some are concerned about doing something, saying something, not being perfect, being attacked. That's a, a bit of a problem, right? I like to applaud those with ambition who are working on it. It's a journey, a bit of a cliche. Uh, and we find that, you know, with companies, they're very much very open to sharing the learning, the challenges, you know, through our supply chain program at CDP, which Unilever is a part of, 150 companies collaborate to engage their suppliers and say, well, how are we, what, what results are we finding in a certain economy with our suppliers? A lot of suppliers are in emerging economies. Um, what are the challenges? Should we be uh, training our suppliers, investing uh, in suppliers to help them with new technology. Big companies have a lot of resources, some of the suppliers don't. So th this kind of collaboration where one supplier will obviously be delivering to many, many companies. So collaboration is key uh, and we have to do that to create the sustainable economy. And then, then companies can compete as hard as they want. But if we have no sustainable economy, there won't be much to compete for. Yeah, we're not going to uh, get much of the pie um, that we're all sharing is shrinking or or um, getting too hot, to use a, a mixed metaphor, then certainly it's not going to be very valuable for any of us, hence the need for collaboration. Um, a few questions from the audience, which, which I'm going to um, try to bring in now. Um, and sorry, I'm going to paraphrase this just in the interest of time. But the first one I, I hope I could pose to Fiona and Rebecca as representatives of businesses. So the, the question is, um, I'm interested in the panelists' thoughts on the need to produce and consume radically less in order to event avert the worst effects of the climate crisis. Do we need to stop chasing endless economic growth? And if so, what does that mean for companies? So, and we saw yesterday, I think, British Petroleum 
BP writing down something like 17 billion uh, worth of assets because it just doesn't going to be people aren't going to need that oil anymore. Um, for your companies, do, is this a risk? Um, and how do we think about this as becoming a sustainable business? Can it be sustainable in a context of ever increasing growth? I don't know if Fiona or Rebecca, either of you wish to jump on that one. Um, I mean, I can I can speak first of all. Um, I think yeah. I mean, this is this is um, a key one. I think for us, I think we need to, and this is the importance around setting really ambitious targets. Um, you know that that everybody in the business will sign up to because you're right. We ca we can't continue on and make incremental changes um, to our carbon emissions and to the way we do business. We need to think and think very very radically different and innovate as a result of that. Um, you know, there, there will be a way that we can, you know, continue to 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 grow as an organisation. I mean, we have to in order for the the business to be sustainable, but in a way that is extremely efficient um, in the in the products and services that we have, um, and and in a in a way that you know do reduce carbon emissions. But in order to do that, we we need to challenge ourselves, and we need to kind of set that set that challenge so that we can look and really innovate and think very differently how we provide the same kind of services and products that we do today in a very different way going forward. And that might not be in the same kind of business as usual model that we have today in terms of um, you know, constant production of, of products that go to customer homes. It might be done in a very different way, in a, in a very remote way. Um, but unless we set ourselves that ambitious target to radically change and think differently, we're not gonna, we're not gonna move in that mindset and that headspace. Um, it's something that, that I think we we um, we looked at, um, you know, as part of Sky Ocean Rescue, our campaign, when we set ourselves a, um, you know, really challenging target to be single use plastic across our, our operations, our products and supply chain. And we didn't, um, by tw the end of tw this year, the end of 2020, and we had no idea how we were going to get there or whether it would be possible. Um, but it was it was that kind of radical target that really made sure that every single part of the business had full ownership of the target and could really have um, the responsibility and the empowerment to think very differently about how we grow our business and how we change our business. Let's point out that I'm uh, coming to you today across some Sky Broadband, which I paid to upgrade because I needed more more speed. So uh, there was some growth for your business that was, I think, coming from a- I think we were all upgrading our broadband. <laughs> Um, Rebecca, though, is it harder for companies like yours? Because you make things that people use, physical products. Um, how does this growth and kind of consumption, um, is it plausible to have a, a radical target without reducing consumption in some way? So I think the, I mean, the whole way that the consumer goods industry works and, and operates has radically changed over the past few years. Um, and I'd like to think that some of the, the work that we've done has, has contributed to the, towards that. You know, that if you think back over time, consumer goods was very much a linear industry. You know, you, you sourced something, turned it into a product, and that product was disposed of. You know, it was a very linear approach. Now, you know, we and, and many others are embracing a circular economy approach. So actually, it's a very, very different way of looking at the consumption of, of products. And if I think yesterday about you know, the absolute core of the commitments that we made around climate and nature, and it's not about stopping doing bad things. It's about no longer doing anything that's negative. And actually, you know, big focus yesterday was on the regeneration of agriculture and the regeneration of nature. So actually, it's using our business to put something good back in. So, if, you know, if I briefly just think about what does that mean from a value chain perspective for Unilever, if you think about the first part of our value chain, which is the sourcing of crops and commodities and working with farmers, we've done a lot of work over the past 10, 15, 20 years to set up sustainable uh, supply chains. We made a commitment yesterday to zero deforestation by 2023, with the sourcing of our crops and commodities. I talked a little bit about the work that we are launching now on regenerative agriculture. The farm is very much front and center of the work that we're doing. So really thinking about how do we accelerate smallholder inclusion, making sure that we're securing land rights, you know, better agronomy training, access to finance and financial inclusion, and really centering on the development of restorative land practices. So in, not, not about um, uh, negative impacts of agriculture, but actually the very positive impacts that we can have 
of regenerating that land and ensuring that those farmers are, are truly the guardians for the future. And if you think about the work that we're doing in terms of our manufacturing, you know, I talked about the fact that we've moved now to renewable energy across all of our sites. And then if you think finally, which I think is really the, the point of your question, Thomas, around those actual products, you know, we're looking now more and more through an innovation lens of a circular economy approach to that. We made some big packaging announcements um, at the end of last year about looking at a circular economy approach, so recycling and reusing we're putting in place much more of a loop approach. So I think actually when you when you take that regenerative approach right the way across the value chain, you know, it isn't growth at the expense of the planet and people. It's a regenerative approach, which is much more inclusive. So the only growth that we would chase at Unilever is sustainable growth. And the point, you know, the very onus of what we try to do is making sustainable living commonplace. So actually it's around having a business model that helps to do that and regenerates the world rather than takes away from it. That's really a different way to think about it, isn't it? It's so really going to, as we begin this race to zero and really challenge ourselves to innovate, it's going to be really a mind, mindset shift um, that we're going to be working on, on creating. I wonder, Paul and Tanya, if I might take you to this next question I have here on my list. Um, but it's about more the external consequences of some of the, the ideas around net zero. So the person asks, the dual crises of climate change and inequality have been recognized and of course strongly interconnected, but how are the panelists going to ensure the actions taken to get to net zero can also address structural issues that contribute to inequalities and for example, gender inequality? Um, so you know, we're thinking about this transition to net zero, but this is taking place in an economy that we know has some pretty structural problems. Um, we're seeing those exacerbated by the COVID crisis in many ways. Um, so how do we use this transition to try to not just think about um, getting to the regenerative economy that, that Rebecca was mentioning, but actually making that something that works for the people in that, in that economy? Um, I wonder if Paul and Tanya might, might come on to your thoughts on those. That big question from our, our participant. <laughs> so so I, I can go first. Um, I mean, it's the right question. Uh, you know, clearly we see um, many interconnected challenges, crises, you know, not just climate change, but health. It, we all knew inequality existed, but it's brought to the fore in the pandemic crisis. And those who are least able to help themselves tend to be those who suffer most. So we have to move to more of an inclusive economy. Um, the transition to net zero is an enormous transition in, in society uh, and the economy. And uh, the International Labour Organization says that you know, a net positive amount of jobs can be created in that economy. But we need to make sure they're distributed appropriately. You know, the final thing I'll say, uh, we saw the financial crisis 2008. This, you know, deep recession now is probably going to be bigger. So, you know, estimate will definitely be bigger. Governments have, in an unprecedented way, helpfully and thankfully stepped in to help the economy through the crisis. And then you know, there is a renewal of the economy. You know, the World Economic Forum talks about now's the time to reset capitalism. The Sustainable Development Goals give us a framework we don't just want a net zero economy. We want a net zero economy where everybody has meaningful work, you know, their basic needs are met. Um, we reduce inequality, we end racism. This all needs to be designed together. That's an enormous task for governments, business, civil society, for all of us. And, you know, what I'm very grateful about is we are actually having the debate now. Um, the answers are going to be complex, but we have to get there and we have to have high ambition on climate, high ambition on inequality, High ambition to end racism and yeah, and then develop and design what to do with the future of society. Indeed, a big challenge. Tanya, what do you think how we can best approach it? Yeah, and I would add to many of um, Paul's comments. There is no doubt that this is a massive social justice issue. Uh, we've seen incredible work and thinking through the sustainable development goals, but realistically, structurally, we know that there are huge swathes of uh, communities around the world who effectively are already set up to be most impacted by a climate and a nature crisis. And realistically, that is driven by heavy consumption from established and in some aspects of emerging economies as well. So the question in, in thinking about net zero and all the many other commitments is, how do we actually start to level that up? Uh, in what world is it reasonable to only just slightly throttle back some consumption levels in parts of the world that have enabled that consumption for many, many, not just years, decades? 
but also to look quite realistically at some of the very specific and intrinsic challenges that we know that communities will have in terms of access to water, access to good quality soils. You know, there's a whole range of environmental and social factors as well as jobs. So I don't think we, should, we shouldn't shy away from the debate. I think that the system and the inequalities in it will be um, not just enlightening, but actually I think could enable businesses and our response globally through the policies to make some of the right decisions and again, some of the more resilient decisions uh, for the future. I suppose the only other reflection I would add is one of the downsides of the net zero headline is it's quite reductive. So there's something about where's the net gain? And really some of the thinking around things like regeneration, if you like, how are we putting back some of what has been taken away? And I also think that would help significantly in terms of, again, starting to address some of these much more systemic issues that have effectively removed resources um, and challenged the rights of some of the communities sitting and living and working in, in many of those settings around the world. Those connections between getting to zero greenhouse gases while also getting to um, positive values for nature, for people's lives, for, for equality um, needs to be part of the conversation. So we've had some big picture questions. We've also had a few as we get to the, toward the end of our time here, some more practical questions about next steps. Um, so for example, someone asks, how do we join the Race to Zero campaign? So I'm happy to, to point you in the right direction for that one. You join all these great organizations that are working on, on it. Race to Zero is an umbrella that the uh, COP26 team and the high level climate champions have put forward, incorporating all of the um, existing efforts by businesses, investors, cities, et cetera, to push toward net zero. Has, um, un unlike previous iterations, has some uh, criteria to make sure these commitments are, are robust and are, are delivering what they need to deliver. Um, but I think the UN Global Compact Network has played a huge role with the 1.5 pledge um, and these kinds of and science based targets and other efforts to give businesses opportunities to to um, join a community that's trying to make steps in those directions. Um, the question though that's come up is, okay, we're gonna join the race to zero, but what impact is that actually going to have? Um, Paul, you mentioned this idea of an ambition loop where commitments by businesses might help jog or, or promote um, further efforts. Can you maybe unpack that a bit more for us? What, um, what can businesses joining the race to zero um, through these different platforms, what can they reasonably expect to have others step up with them? Are they gonna be left by themselves or what can they ask governments to, to do specifically to help them get there? Yeah, but, I mean, I'll be brief, but I think this ambition loop is really key. You know, by businesses signing up to business ambition to 1.5, setting a science based target, some of the key race to zero elements, um, businesses then can engage their suppliers, their customers as employees. And particularly with governments, we do see now a much more strategic dialogue between many governments, not all it's fair to say, um, where so business can say, that we want to do this, we can do this much, but we need this kind of policy. We need an incentive, we need a change in the tax law, we need a carbon price, we need something on trade, you know, it's quite complicated, some of this stuff. But that, for that strategic dialogue, for ideally a group of businesses to come together and talk to governments, about, we need these policies or these signals from you, and then we can go further faster. Uh, and equally for governments to say, well, actually, we want to bring in this policy and 10 businesses are with us and 50 businesses against us. This is quite difficult for government. So we need to have that dialogue, be aligned on the ambition. And what are the steps to get there that business, government, investors and others can, can all take together and help others to go further? There's a big summit coming up in November, coming up next November because the COP has been pushed back by year. It's actually a really good moment for businesses to be thinking about how to engage with governments as they're beginning to think about what their next steps and ambition might be. Um, I wonder if I might, keeping on the theme of practical next steps, call on, on Tanya, Rebecca, and Fiona to share us, what's your kind of key takeaway for the audience today? We're gonna join the race to zero, that's already a given. That, that one's ticked off, the bo uh, that box is ticked. What are some other practical next steps that we might um, start doing here? And feel free to jump in, whoever has a, has a thought. I'll, I'll jump in quickly. Um, I think that, from a practical next step perspective, I really like the way that Fiona and Rebecca have framed, yes, some of the politics or the policies, yes, the steps that they need to take as a business, but also keeping an eye on their consumer in terms of how are they helping customers? 
Right now, we know that so many people feel utterly overwhelmed by the challenges. And I think if, if businesses can reach in both those directions to enable all of us, um, not just through our working life, but actually through our day-to-day -day practical life to take some of those steps, uh, then let's hope we back some of those businesses moving forward as well. Great. Becca, if you um, I would, I would probably say um, you, you need to make a public commitment. You need to understand what your, your target is and, and, and go out there and make a public commitment. If you don't want to necessarily do it on your own, I, you know, you, you can't do this on your own without collaborating with others, other suppliers, other businesses, and particularly people within your um, sector. So, um, you, you know, Marcia, um, you know, and, and Relics are part um, alongside us as part of a responsible business media forum. And that's a great way of sharing um, you know, commitments and um, plans around climate. And, you know, we're looking at how we can come together to kind of have a sector approach to net zero carbon. And we've done the same thing with BAFTA Albert Consortium around measuring and understanding the emissions associated with products and production. Um, um, so I would say, have a look around and see what your sector's doing. Um, whether there's, you know, there's something that you can you can join so that you have the same approach with others in your sector, but collaborate with other businesses and learn that way. Your your peers to begin working together, really important next step. Rebecca, your thought on the practical next steps we can take forward from here? Well, so, so certainly on our side, we announced ten big new commitments yesterday, so I've got a clear word of, of things that we need to do. But you know, I think from that, I would say make bold public commitments you know it, i think that's really really important and that's expected by stakeholders now you know and i think the second part about that is and, we, and we've learned a lot about this over the past 10 years with the sustainable living plan both where we did well and also where we didn't do so well and, and, and we realized and took the learnings from that which is you know measure um measure what you treasure be very transparent about that um and and i think you know be very open and transparent you know we're increasingly using technology to be able to you know when we make commitments around things like zero deforestation actually working with tech partners now on satellite mapping you know, looking at what we can do really you know blockchain for consumers really being able to show to consumers the provenance of where they're but of the product that they're using or the service that they've signed up to you know what's behind that what's in the value chain and tech like blockchain is hugely hugely important for transparency and being able to unpack what's going on you know and then i think Lastly, to, to, to the point of, of consumers working collectively, you know, one of the things that we, we made a commitment to yesterday was carbon labeling uh, for all of our products. You know, and historically, that's something in the consumer goods industry that's been really, really challenging. Because if I walk into a supermarket and I pick up a product and it says 10, I, I don't really understand is 10 good, is it bad, is it indifferent, 10 what, what you know, I don't really understand what that means. Right. And I think, to, you know, everyone's comments working within your industry to set very clear guidelines and parameters and holding yourselves to account is really really important way for us to be able to bring all of the stakeholders who are necessary on this journey on board so that we realize that we've got a collective and shared responsibility absolutely and i think that point of learning as we go along is really important because it's a huge race and we're all going to be figuring out no one knows exactly how we're going to get there yet but we need to get there and that's the message that's really come through very clearly from our fantastic pan panelists. So thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Tanya. Let me pass mm -hmm. back to Marcy to tell us um, after the final thoughts as we come to a close. Well, thank you very much, um, Thomas, for hosting so well. Thank you for your very um, inspiring contributions, Fiona, Paul, Tanya, and Rebecca. Um, here's some of what I heard. You know, why focus on this now? There's a need for global collective action, which has been accentuated by the global pandemic. I heard about the three A's, ambition, action, and advocacy. I also heard that this is about pre-competitive collaboration, that it saves us money. It helps our suppliers to get there too, and we need to, to help them to do that. That we need to create that ambition loop, which Paul talked about to meet the expectations of a full range of stakeholders and that we also need to be thinking about a fair distribution of net zero jobs. Um, these are themes that we're going to be carrying forward at the RELX SDG Inspiration Day on the 24th of June in partnership with the UN Global Compact UK, the UN Global Compact India, the Ban Ki-moon Centre for Global Citizens, 
uh, the Responsible Media Forum, which Fiona talked about, um, and also Global Citizen, and the details are on the RELX SDG Resource Center. We need to say a special thank you to our colleagues uh, at the Secretariat for the UN Global Compact UK Network, of course to all of you for joining, and then I wanted to wish a special happy anniversary to the UN Global Compact for 20 great years. Here's to 20 more years of mobilizing business action to address climate change and to achieve the SDGs. And I'm gonna paraphrase something that I heard Al Gore say yesterday in one of the sessions. Will is a renewable resource. Thank you, enjoy the rest of the Leaders Summit, and we look forward to catching up with you on this conversation. Please reach out to us at the UN Global Compact UK Network. We would love to work alongside you. Thanks, everyone.